The problem is this, is that we have eye tracking systems that look at the way we move our eyes. So if I move my eyes from here to here, that's something that we need to be able to see. And we need it for the science because we need to be able to see, for example, how the brain causes those things to happen. But it's critically important to vision that we move our eyes, and here's why. So if you stick out your thumb at arm's length, your elbow's straight, and you look at your thumbnail, I don't know if you knew this, but your thumbnail is the only thing you can see. Your thumbnail is the only place you've ever seen 2020 vision. So when you go to the doctor and you get glasses like mine, you're only correcting really that very center part of your vision, or at least that's the only part you really care about correcting to, with very high quality. Because everywhere else, you're essentially legally blind, okay? So, so since that's the, that tiny little place, which is 0.1% of your entire visual field, that's one square visual degree of angle, and, uh, and you, can, you have roughly 1,000 square degrees of visual angle in your entire visual field. That means that you have to move your eyes around as you walk around. So let's consider what happened with me getting here, coming into this room. I walked through the door. I walked over to here. It took, what, maybe four seconds to arrive here in a laboratory with all this expensive equipment in it, right? And during that time, I made one to three eye movements per second in order to sample the high qual with high quality the, the, the materials that everything in the lab is made out of, okay? So, by doing that, my brain was able to take that high quality information and the low quality information in the surround and build a simulation of this entire laboratory in 10 to 20 seconds, okay? That I can now navigate through and not fall over and not break any expensive equipment and do all my experiments in, okay? That's, that's incredible. It's incredible that the brain has this power to make this simulation. And it's critically important that we understand eye movements because there's people who can't make them and they can't see very well. And there's also people who need high quality eye tracking because that's the way they communicate with the world. A most famous example is if you'll remember Stephen Hawking, he used to drive around in this wheelchair. And even after he, he couldn't use his hands at all anymore, he could operate his eyes, okay? So certain diseases you can move your eyes, but you can't move anything else. He couldn't speak, for example. And what that meant was that his eyes were his interface with the world, and the higher quality of the eye tracking, the better. Now, the problem is this. With eye tracking, you can only get so good. We typically use a video camera, like the ones that are pointed at me right now, but very up close and looking at the eye, or using a telescopic lens from, from farther away. Those lenses can only see so much motion of my eye. And in fact, they can't see the smallest motion that we call tremor. We know tremor exists from other types of experiments. It's very difficult to measure in the laboratory. And we need a way to measure tremor as well as all of the other tiny little eye movements that happen, even when you fixate your gaze, because otherwise we won't have a complete picture of what the brain's doing. And these eye movements can give us hints about diseases in the brain, diseases of vision, and it's critical that we understand it all. Okay, so how do we do this? If you don't have a system that can see tremor, how do you know that you've made one that works? Like, so let's say, okay, I, I invented a new tremor detection system. I point it at your eye and I say, look, I can see tremor. Well, how do you know that's not just noise? How do you know that's not something else besides tremor? And the answer is, well, you have to calibrate the camera system on something you actually understand. And so we set out to develop a system that moves like an eye, but moves even smaller than an eye in a way that we can control completely so that we can understand it, okay? And that's why we built this ocular motor robot. Once we have um, actually calibrated the system and we know exactly how it moves and that we can make motions that are smaller than what a human eye could actually do, we're now ready to calibrate modern eye trackers against the system. So we take the mirror off and we put now a human glass eye on there. And now this glass eye rotates instead of a mirror and we can point a video eye tracker, a modern video eye tracker, directly at that eye. And we can make normal large eye movements and show that the eye trackers can see our glass eye make normal eye movements. And then we can use the robot to make very small eye movements. 
very, very tiny eye movements that human eyes can't make, or rather, human eyes do make, but normal eye trackers can't see. And so we'll verify that those eye trackers can't see that, and then we'll put the improvements of our new video system in, in there and show that the new video system can see those very small eye movements that modern eye trackers can't see. And we'll be able to also use the system to test all of the trackers that are available in the world against each other and show which ones can do what and how good they work. Where our eye tracker will be hopefully able to catch the entire domain of human eye movements across, across all sizes and speeds.